Hello, hello everyone, it's Martin AK Anders, and in today's video, I want to dive a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of Harbor. At this point, it feels like every pro and content creator, including myself, has had their shot at a take on the agent, but I want to dive into why those takes are what they are. Let's jump right in. Well, at this point, I fully expect everyone to know what Harbor's abilities are. I am going to rapid fire them for the sake of comprehensiveness. First, we have Cove, the agent's only spherical smoke. In this, he equips a sphere of shielding water, firing it to throw, alternatively firing it to underhand throw, and upon impacting the ground, it spawns a water shield that blocks bullet. Importantly, this smoke has a finite amount of health and fades shortly after being destroyed. While full firing with a single vandal, it takes just under two seconds to fully destroy. Next up, we have Cascade, which will equip a wave of water, firing it to send the wave rolling forward and through walls. You can recast this ability to stop the forward movement of that, and players who hit and or walk through this ability are slowed. For Harbor's signature ability, we have High Tide, which allows him to equip a wall of water that he fires out, and by holding his fire button, he can steer it much akin to a Phoenix Wall. By alt firing, he can end this prematurely, and much like Cascade, players who are hit by this wall and or walk through it are slowed. Finally, we have his ultimate ability Reckoning, in which he will equip and then fire a very large geyser pool onto a specific area, we're talking roughly the size of an entire site. Enemy players in this area are targeted by successive small zonal stuns, and in addition to that, those stuns have a vertical indicator, a small light that extends to the sky where they are targeting, making this particularly useful when pushing into areas that would otherwise have cover, such as a Viper Ultimate. While the bare basics of Harbor are relatively interesting, the main purpose of this video and what I want to dive into is going to be a lot more of the minutia, how Harbor fits into a grander system, and by extension how I think that will project his efficacy in the game and his place in the meta. To do that, our first port of call will be using a system familiar to many of my longtime followers, and that will be Style Dynamics. For those of you who are new and don't know what this system is, it's largely borrowed from TCGs, and I'll link down in the description below a pair of videos that do a good job of concisely catching you up. To understand Harbor's place in the broader controller meta, I want to convert the normal three-point Venn diagram of Style Dynamics and pivot it more into a continuous triangular scale, and with that we can take the current controllers and plot them out. We have Brimstone squarely in the heart of aggro, and Astra similarly in midrange. We have Omen as a near perfect bridge between aggro and control, and then we have Viper as the sole representative towards that control corner of the triangle. But one of these things is not like the others. This is something I've spoken to a bit when looking at the game's balance in the past, and that's that when we look at each of these three corners of the triangle in isolation, in two of the three there is a very central orb smoker that can function as a primary controller. Prior to the major agent rebalancing that we saw in patch 4.04, .04, Astra was in a little bit more of a middling position where she straddled the line between control and midrange. This created a little bit more of a balance, where you could fudge your way into having a pseudo-control primary controller. Ever since that point though, we've seen a very distinct metagame shift where, if you look at every composition that has found major success over the last couple of months, they are almost in exclusivity aggro and midrange compositions. It was because of these factors that when we got spoilers that Harbor was going to be a controller, my initial instinct was, oh, surely he is going to be that central pillar that control is actively missing. This was even magnified further when I heard that he was water-themed. The design space for potential information with leaving wet trails or creating slows or concusses from splashes for stall are all things that are very easily malleable into the control space. You can imagine my surprise now when we got Harbor and instead of being that central orb-smoking control agent, he was an aggressive wall smoker who was squarely aimed at introducing more choice and opportunity cost when picking Viper. A major repercussion of this is that when looking at controllers, we now have three agents who are either aggro or aggro adjacent when we still don't have a control pillar. This means that we have two archetypes who are much more rich in choice than the third, aggro obviously being one of them, but midrange, aggro's direct counter being the other. 
As a result, aggro, despite having the most choice it's ever had, also has to be the most selective it's ever been in how it crafts its compositions, because the presumption is, is that it will be facing almost exclusively mirror matchups and matchups into the thing that is supposed to beat it. To aid in that selection process, we can take a look at these aggro controllers and understand the niches that they fill. Looking at the abstracted utility value that each of these agents bring, you first have Brimstone who brings Explosive Orb Smokes, Zone Denial, and a Combat and Movement Steroid. Then you have Omen who has Cast Time Gated Orb Smokes, a Self-Oriented Movement Ability, and a Large Zone Catalytic Utility. Then we have Harbor, who has a specialty multifunctional orb smoke, a travel time gated scaling wall, and a semi explosive large format wall. While these unique utility suites are quite a bit to go off of in and of themselves, you can go even a step further by placing them into recurring play patterns and understand in the perfect world how is this agent being played and what role do they fit within a composition. A Brimstone non attack will generally play in the following pattern. He'll have an optional smoke on default, this would be something like smoking off the top of a long so that his team can scale more effectively. He'll use an optional stim for an accelerated cancel option or rotate. This would be in response to a defensive counter aggro where the decision of where his team has to hit has become very linear and so he can commit the resources very early and is more concerned about timing than he is about saving utility for a harder hit. And then obviously there is the burst smoke itself for the execute, the stim if he still has it for marginal exec efficacy and getting through bottlenecks, and then his molly he'll either use during the execute for zone denial or hold for post to supply his team with a little bit of reach. Reach being the style dynamics concept that covers utility, tools, and tactics that are used to convert the last little bit for an aggro composition, in this particular instance being using that molly for a little bit of defuse denial. Looking at defense, things are a lot more non-linear. There's still an optional smoke on default. This is going to be, again, for conditioning purposes. Then you have a little bit more of a branch decision tree. If you're counter aggroing, there's a very likely scenario where using his stim here for incremental advantage or an accelerated push through if that counter aggro ends up not finding any opponents. If his sight is hit, he'll likely be using his molly for stall or for plant denial and then using burst smokes for a retake. And if the other side is hit, he'll likely use his stim for an accelerated rotate and then burst smoke for a retake there. All in all, this means that Brimstone's value proposition as an aggro controller is to provide explosive vision obstruction on attacking executes as well as reach and post. And then on defense, having a very distinct soft hold preference where he leans on his molly as a stall mechanism as well as his burst smokes for retakes. And he has a flood retake bias because of that stall that he is providing. Brimstone's identity, whether by intention or not, is largely focused around buying an extra little bit of time. On attack, he explodes on exex, and then he uses his molly as reach for that last little bit of time to prevent defuses. Then, on defense, he's using, almost in the exactly inverse way, his molly to buy a little bit of extra time for flood retakes, or using his stim to give his own rotation that extra little bit of time to provide an adequate flood retake for the other side of the map. Next, we have Omen, and his attack side will follow a vaguely similar pattern. He'll have an optional smoke on default for similar scaling reasons, then he'll use staggered smokes for execute, and here's where the major difference comes in. As opposed to having explosive smokes and reach, he's going to have his paranoia for added exec explosivity, and then he will have a shrouded step as a situational repositioning option in post plan. On defense, we're going to use a similar three-point decision tree to break up how the defense can be played. First off, he's going to have that optional smoke on default. Omen in particular, it's less optional than the other agents here. His ability to find a lot more one ways than other agents makes this a very non-trivial part of his value offer. Regardless, if you find an Omen counter aggroing, he'll generally be using his paranoia for counter aggro explosivity, that primary catalytic element. If his sight is hit, he'll likely be using that paranoia for counter exec and hard stall. And if the other side is hit, you'll usually see the Omen pre smoking and then using his paranoia in an explosive set retake. This leaves Omen with a value offer that's mostly built on explosive exec catalyzation and movement and positional tools on attack, and a defensive offer of a really strong hard hold preference that can utilize that counter exec paranoia, as well as an important to note set retake bias. 
Omen's at his best when he's either on a site prior to it being hit, and he can use that paranoia as a counter exec mechanism on a primary bottleneck, or when he's rotating in late and throwing that paranoia at predictable post plant locations. Him flood rotating is not his forte. He'll have to aim that paranoia and guess as to transitional positions of the attackers, and the consistency with which he'll be able to find value is just not there. That finally brings us to Harbor, who on attack will use an optional high tide on default for map slicing or isolation. Then he'll use all of his explosivity mechanics coming in for the exec. A cascade for pre-exec scaling, a high tide if it's back off of cooldown or he never used it in the first place for that execute itself, and then a cove for plant insulation. Harbor's defense is where he really diverges from the other aggro controllers. Due to the internal cooldown on high tide, it's very strongly preferred that he uses it on default for map slicing. Then, if he's counter aggroing, he'll use that cascade to supplement the scaling of that counter aggro or to create a situation that facilitates a rolling retreat for that counter aggro should things go wrong. From there, I have highlighted a very distinct change in language. We're no longer talking about sites being hit, we're talking about sides being hit. Harbor is very likely never going to be a side anchor for you. He is going to be stacked on a site that is going to be counter aggroing or doing something proactive, but he is not designed to anchor basically at all. Instead, you'll see him playing intermediate spaces with a certain sided lean, and then he will reactively bolster those sides when necessary. For instance, if his side is hit, he'll immediately use a cascade to enable a rolling retreat for any forward defenders or stall, and then he'll use his second cycle high tide for a set retake, finally using his cove for defuse insulation. If any of you read ahead, you're going to realize now why this is a little wacky. If the other side is hit, his play pattern doesn't change at all. He'll immediately move to use a cascade to enable a rolling retreat for forward defenders or stall, then he will rotate in using his second cycle high tide for a set retake and use his cove for a defuse insulation. As much as I hate how much of a cringy water pun this is, Harbor's entire kit is designed for him to float between sites until an exec has happened. At that point, his entire suite of utility is tuned for a set retake. And we can look at a lot of this in action. Let's look at attack first. Pearl is unsurprisingly one of Harbor's home field advantage maps. Whenever a new agent comes out, it's typically really strong on the most recently released map. On attack, we can follow the exact flow that we described. You'll use a cascade to scale aggressively, then you'll use your high tide for exec smokes, and then you'll use your cove for a plant insulation. We can watch this in real time in the game as well. You can see the cascade goes out, the harbor immediately scales up, throws the high tide for exec smokes, throws the cove, scales, and plants. While in that example we left an opening in the back of U-Haul very intentionally to allow a push through from our teammates, you can also do very different things with Harbor's high tide. For example here we'll use a much more comprehensive high tide that requires a little bit more of a lineup. Starting from the tucked cubby on B long, you can shoot your high tide across the site, being very precise in the way that you lay it out, and you can provide a full 5 orb smokes worth of coverage. On the other half of the map, much of the same is true. You throw that cascade out early to provide initial scaling, then as you get close to the site, you're going to curve your high tide to provide as many smokes worth of effective coverage as you possibly can, and throw your cove to insulate your planter. On defense, things are a little bit more intricate, but we are going to lean heavily on that default high tide, allowing us to counter aggro consistently. Looking at this one, which has become an early personal favorite of mine, you start from the barrier in B link, and your high tide can double segment out shops while also providing coverage to club. This allows for great early counter aggressions towards long, but more importantly, the position that you find your harbor in is exactly what I was describing an intermediate space central location that allows for quick reinforcement of every major channel of the map. From here we have three primary cascade options. We can quickly rotate towards B, throwing it long to create a rolling retreat opportunity for our counter aggro and reinforcing that site. We can throw it mid to posture a potential lurk coming through shops or an early push through, 
or we can rotate towards a link, throwing it towards long to create a quick stall mechanism and allow our team to rotate in. Shifting where our presumed teammates are, you can see that these cascades don't provide negative conditioning for us either. If we end up allocating it towards mid repeatedly, we can later on use it to create a very significant mid presence and get early shop control. Alternatively, we can use it to create a supplemented rolling retreat opportunity for an A main counter aggro, and can even adjust the way that we're throwing it towards A main to create an even more powerful isolated effect where we shut down that corridor. Of equal if not greater importance though are Harbor's retakes. In a situation where we're retaking with B-Link control, you can throw your high tide to double segment out B-Long. This not only makes an offsite post extremely uncomfortable for attackers, but it also gives an opportunity for a deep flank, while we still are able to lean on that cove for a defuse insulation. Looking at a B-retake without Link control, we come to an example that I think really highlights Harbor's long tail scale ceiling opportunity, because there's two very, very different but equally viable options here. In the first, you cove out from CT in order to get access to U-Haul, and you high tide out to block B-Link as well as B-Long. Simple to the point, it breaks the three-point crossfire that makes the initial scaling out CT a nightmare when retaking this site. Here's an alternative that I came across during my workshopping. Before you expose yourself to a site side LOS, you can throw your high tide curving it multiple times to create a tunnel of sorts into U-Haul, and then doubling it back creating a near full obstruction between the site and long. Depending on the attacking plant position, as well as where we expect post plant positions to be, we can now throw our cove in a far more flexible way where we can use it to deny a B-Link push, we can use it for that standard defuse denial. There are a number of options here that are fundamentally more flexible than the one that I just showed. That said, the wall itself obviously is a hell of a lot harder to throw. Looking at the A site, it's much of the same. Multi-intersection high tides that create an uncomfortable off-site post and then a cove to enable an insulated defuse. And now that we've seen a lot of it in action, we can be a lot more confident in stating where Harbor fits within this aggro controller submeta. We have Brimstone, who on attack is an explosive exec smoker with reach and on defense has a soft hold preference and a flood retake bias. You then have Omen, who on attack is an explosive exec catalyst with a movement and positional tool, and on defense has a hard hold preference and a set retake bias. And then we have Harbor, who on attack is pre-exec scaling and space isolation with a plant insulation mechanic, and on defense has a soft hold preference with a set retake bias. The way each of these three play on attack is always going to be vastly different. I don't think that there's any way where you're going to find extreme continuity with that unless you have agents who literally have the same abilities, but on defense we see a lot more convergence in terms of the silos. Everything has either a soft or hard hold preference, and everything has either a flood retake or a set retake bias. And now we finally get to the question of where do we see Harbor fitting into this grand scheme given all of the above? I think the key to that lies in what the broader metagame outside of controllers or anything else is currently trying to do. We can look at the lay of the land and the reality is, is that right now the metagame is just infinite droves of aggro comp, midrange comp, aggro comp, midrange comp, and almost all of them have a backbone of a chamber. A huge part of that is what chamber's able to do on defense. He is quite literally the agent embodiment of a one-man rolling retreat. He sets his rendezvous, he takes an early informational position, he plays it until it becomes unsafe, then he snaps his teleport and he is immediately at the second phase of a rolling retreat. Some teams employ this functionality in a little bit less efficient of a way where instead of using it as a stage one and two of a rolling retreat, they use it as a single stage soft hold. Harbor can slot well into this dynamic, specifically in nudging teams more towards that higher efficiency rolling retreat route. A chamber can now not only use his teleport to immediately go from phase 1 to phase 2, but because he is in such a forward informational position for that first teleport, he can then be the early warning system that calls in for a floating harbor's cascade, and that will then facilitate his from second stage to third stage transition of the rolling retreat. You can have a weak side chamber supplemented by a harbor 
become an extremely, extremely potent three-stage rolling retreat. That synergy isn't isolated to defense, though. When we look at the attack half of the map, one of the most prolific issues with chamber compositions is the lack of explosivity in their executes. Harbor's ability to slice and dice sites, as well as use Cascade to facilitate those dry walkouts, is going to make the absence of those explosive dive agents a lot less felt, and I think that's ultimately where Harbor's largest value proposition lies. You can look at the multi-stage rolling retreat facilitation that I talked about on defense, and at the end of the day, you can do the same thing with Viper. It will be a little bit more sunk cost in that you'll have to commit a poison cloud to it, and it's just statically there when you would otherwise be able to get more refreshable value out of it in a broader view. But in end effect, you're getting the same sort of staged coverage that you're creating with Harbor. Yes, Harbor is a little bit more dynamic, it's a little less of a hard tell when compared to Viper, but Viper can still replicate it nearly enough. What Viper can't replicate in any way is the actual proxy for explosivity that Harbor provides. So let's get down to the brass tacks of it. I've said that Harbor's primary value add and where he fits in this metagame is going to be largely in his ability to proxy explosivity for non-explosive compositions. Everything else can be replicated in one way or another by Viper or by other controllers in the game. If that's Harbor's primary function, how good is his kit at actually providing it? You see, Cascade isn't true coverage. It doesn't provide bullet impenetrability like Cove, which is honestly what I expected out of his kit given the trailer video that we saw where we literally had a wall blocking bullets. I thought for sure it was coming, but it's not in the game. So what does that cover do? If my agent's main value prop is, ah yes, I'm an aggro controller that adds explosivity to comps that lack it, and then I just get spammed into oblivion every single time I try to use that function, does this agent actually have a niche in the meta? Not only that, but how many of these quote-unquote non-explosive comps are we going to realistically have? So much of the metagame is tied up in aggro and mid-range right now that there's explosivity in everything already. Even the compositions that I was hearkening back to from the last year have sort of fallen into obscurity. The triple initiator on Ascent really not that common anymore and it also had agents that while lacking dive still had great utility in terms of getting themselves onto site is this really going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of pushing them over the edge and if so what are you bringing in the harbor for are you dropping one of those three initiators because the comparative value of explosivity that you get out of something like a fade or an aldrone or a KO flash is sure as a hell lot more than a cascade. That's where I sort of fall on with Harbor. I understand that this agent is super cool. The upper bound of his skill ceiling is ludicrous. Even just looking at that one site, Pearl B, we found a five orb smoke value high tide. Those are going to exist on like every single map. But I think genuinely, outside of the efficiency of his ability to smoke, his main value add is that feigned explosivity, that fake explosivity, and it just isn't really there. Like, it, it, it exists in his kit, but the tools that he has to convert it are simply not good enough. I said this when I was on Valoranting earlier this week, where it feels like, based off of what we saw in trailers and what we were delivered with this agent, Riot was worried about his power level and yanked a mechanic. It feels like his Cascade should function almost identically to his Cove in that it provides minimal bullet impenetrability that fades after a certain amount of time. I think that you should put Harbor in a place where his Cove persists past being destroyed and that his Cascade functions in the exact same way. Absorbs a few bullets, dies, becomes just a vanilla LOS obstructor after that, and then Harbor fills the niche that we've discussed at this point. His ability to proxy explosivity goes through the roof. The agent has a very clear role. He has tools that are absolutely gangbusters for it, and he just goes to work. That is what I'd love to see out of this agent. We'll see how it pans out. Maybe I'm underselling Cascade in its current format, and the thing's actually fucking ridiculous. Who knows? I obviously haven't had any time on it. I haven't seen it in matches, so only time will tell. But 
I appreciate you entertaining this massive rant of mine. Would love to hear your thoughts down below in the comments. Obviously, new agent, everyone's got their take. I tried to go through this in a little bit more of a structured way so that it's not just, oh, I think this agent is trash and he needs buff, or oh, I think this agent's broken and he needs nerfs. I'm always going to be the one who tries to systematize it and really sort of get down to something a lot more provable and based in logic than just intuition and feel. Before we go, I did want to make a couple quick plugs. I have completely reinvigorated my Patreon where I post ranked and competitive queue oriented tier lists. This is going to be a map by map listing of how good I think agents are in ranked queue on any given patch. It will be updated whenever there's new balance and that will go out to that Patreon. You can find it at patreon.com backslash Anders TV. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to all of my members and get this. I actually have to look at my other screen because we have enough now that I can't read them off the top of my head. Huge thank you to Spencer, Me1, Crampeat, Golden Fury, Hick Messiah, and Colin Torbis. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.